Hey, how's it going? Adder32 here. Welcome back to Remembrance. Alright. At last. Hello, Kimberly. I am Umbra, the demiurge responsible for the creation of the surface. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's nice to finally meet you, Umbra. There's a number of things I've been wanting to ask you about for quite a while now. Master. Hello again, Jesse. I've missed you. Oh, how I've missed you as well. It's so good to see you again, Master. Indeed, it has been far too long. Please forgive my extended absence. You don't need to apologize, truly. I'm delighted for merely being able to see you again at all. I am pleased to hear it. Sheesh, get a room, you two. The Ashen Force. Hey, Shady. Did you miss me? <laughs> Hardly. Your mere presence is one of ill omen. I had hoped that you would never again intrude into any of the spheres under the jurisdiction of the Queen of All after your last act of interference. My last act of interference, huh? That's funny. I could have sworn all I was doing was cleaning up the foul, rotting mess that you'd left behind. Wait, you two know each other? We've been acquainted. <laughs> yes, to my emphatic dismay. The Ashen Force has interfered with the execution of any number of the directives put forth by Sylaventra, the Queen of All, including, as you can gather by its presence here, this current one, and loath though I am to acknowledge it, not even the Queen herself is capable of detouring or even predicting the Ashen Force's movements or actions, despite our best continual and most concerted efforts to do so. You could even say I'm a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> I see? Master, I don't mean to interrupt, but what do you mean by the spheres under Selaventra's control? A sphere is a meta-region of space-time, to be more precise. A sphere is any self-contained subset of the larger existence with its own flow of time. Everything here from the surface to above the sky and from the outskirts to the heartland constitutes this one sphere of existence, for instance. I see. Well, in any case, like I said before, I have a few questions I'd very much like you to answer, Umbra, now that I've completed your mission. More than a few, in fact. By all means, ask away. Why did Jesse and I have to fight hand to hand with the crawlers? I mean, aren't you basically God here? You could destroy all of the crawlers on the surface with a snap of your fingers, right? So why didn't you? Because of several binding particulars of the segment of the directive that I was responsible for implementing. I was and still am not permitted to take any direct destructive or eliminative actions against the enemies of hope, regardless of the extent of damage or havoc that they inflict as their presence to any extent was not at all accounted for in the original scope of the directive and the binding terms of this directive were immutable. In other words, your hands were tied because of your orders. Yes. That's a pretty flimsy excuse. Let me guess, your orders also kept you from reactivating the lamps and towers yourself. Rather, I made several attempts to do exactly that long before the decision was made to summon a chosen one, but the tendency of the enemies of hope to nest within the interiors of the Towers of Remembrance combined with their vast numbers soon resulted in concentrations of negative energy in the Towers of Remembrance that were so immensely potent that they immediately extinguished the hope beacons whenever I attempted to illuminate them myself. Because you eliminated the strongest of the nesting enemies of hope before activating the beacons, they remained active rather than shutting back off. I was not permitted to do the same. Really, now. I have no more love for the enemies of hope than you do, Kimberly. Had I the freedom to do so, I would have long since exterminated a lot of them. Even sending Jesse to assist you and take combat action against the enemies of hope to protect you required a very generous interpretation of the terms. What are they, anyway? The crawlers, I mean. I conducted a considerable amount of experimentation during the creation of the surface with the fundamental underlying principles that govern the behavior and physical interactions of all materials native to this sphere. And while I dare say the bulk of my work was a considerable success, I did not properly account for two crucial factors, an oversight that eventually resulted in this project's failure and the need to retrieve a chosen one. The first factor is that human spirits emanate tremendous amounts of energy, 
especially in response to pronounced mental or emotional distress. And this energy is released outward into the environment when the spirit is not anchored inside of a body, as was the case for all of those that came here. The second factor is the immense magnitude and depth of the malevolence that is dormant in human spirits. While the first factor has a certain amount of utility in that it made possible the Chosen One protocol, it, when taken in conjunction with the second factor, ultimately proved to be disastrous in its consequences. Nevertheless, having given you the necessary context, I can now fully answer your question, Kimberly. The enemies of hope are the tangible animate forms of extremely pure human malevolence detached forcibly from the spirits that originated them, as in their pure evil, as if. I see you're as abysmal as explaining things as ever, Umbra, so I'll do it. Kim, evil doesn't mean anything. It's just a word humans throw around to describe things they don't like or don't understand. Familiarity is good. Strangeness is evil. Your friends are good. Your enemies are evil. I could go on, but you get my point. You can call the crawlers evil, but you'll never actually understand what they are if you do. You'll just end up blindly fearing and reveling them. Or reviling? I don't know what that word was there. <laughs> okay. But since you genuinely want to know what they are, I'll tell you. They are the fear, anxiety, resentment, rage, loathing, despair, pain, and dread of the people who were brought here shaped into physical bodies. They're just nothingness that's been cemented into a physical form by all of the emotions and parts of your mind you try not to think about. When the poor saps who ended up here approached the towers and were made to remember the gory details of their repressed trauma, it overwhelmed them. They started hemorrhaging na native negative energy, which quickly began to materialize into those crawlers. And when the crawlers attacked, the resulting panic and pain made even more crawlers appear, so the whole thing ballooned out of control. That's... That's so horrible. Of course, that last bit there is mostly just me speculating about how it all went down. Jess? Shady, can you confirm? Is that in fact how it happened? I was waiting for Kim for most of it, but your scenario is consistent with what fraction of it I did witness. Your intuition's correct, yes. How do you know all of this anyway? Aren't you an outsider to all this? Just who are you, Ashley, or rather, what are you? You go first, huh? I'll tell you who and what I am, but you have to tell me who and what you are first. Why? You already know that, don't you? If you want me to answer your question, then do it. Okay. I'm Kim and I'm a human being. And what does that actually tell me about the foundational nature of who, of who you are at your core? Or about what it actually means to be a human being? All you've given me are two names. Two names that other people assigned to you before they knew anything about who you were as a person at that. If you wanted to give me a meaningful answer, you'd struggle a bit, since it's nearly impossible to put such a complex abstract idea into words, no? Explaining who or what you are to another person isn't simple as that, so don't go around acting like this. <laughs> Fair point. Anyway, I'm Ashley, and I'm the sole enforce enforcer agent of the pandimensional pan fundamental principle of disruption, flux, and revitalization. What? If it makes it easier to understand, you could think of me like a decomposer, but instead of eating carrion, I eat dying societies, planets, and spheres. Like this one. <laughs> Master. Oh. Hmm? What's wrong, Madame Gloomy? Do I intimidate you? Yes, very, very much so. <laughs> You're too cute for your own good. Also, don't misunderstand my use of the word agent. I don't report to anyone. I'm free to wander and meddle and act howsoever I please. So then, hypothetically speaking, you could just choose to leave this place without destroying it? Sure, I could choose to do that. I'm not, go I'm not going to, though. I despise Sillaventra. If she had her way, all of existence would stagnate and rot away into a vile, sludgy puddle of cosmic pus. And I mean that quite literally. Existence as a whole is a living, growing organism after all. 
On top of that, she's actively and intentionally tried to cripple me and blot me out on several occasions, even though she's the one causing problems. Because of that, I'm going to enjoy every last second of raising this monster-infested garbage dump of a necrotic sphere back into the void. You're wrong. The directives of the Queen of All endeavor only to bring peace and tranquility to all living creatures under her domain. Compared to her and her mission, you are nothing more than a mindless force of death and destruction. Say that again, I fucking dare you. You know... It's always really, really, really pissed me, pissed me off how she calls herself the queen of all when she only controls maybe five spheres at best. There's millions upon billions upon trillions upon quadrillions upon quintillions of spheres, but she's the queen of all because she has five? That pompous self-righteous shithead is no more queen of all than Kim is the queen of the Milky Way galaxy. I'll never, ever let that insufferable blowhard get anywhere close to her ill-conceived, ineffably stupid goal of controlling all of existence. Not that I'll even have to try. After all, all of her little schemes are just as abortive and half-baked as yours are, Shady. Be silent, you monster! How about you make me blondie? Ashley, wait! What? Well, it's just, you know, uh, right? I, I still didn't get to ask Umbra all the questions I have. You know, since I had to do that really shitty mission and stuff, and I had those burning questions about it, we've been over that, haven't we? If you're dead set on destroying Umbra and everything else here, then I can't really stop you. N not that I'd ever dare to try, of course, but... I at least want to get a few more answers about why I got dragged into this whole mess in the first place, you know? It's only fair, right? I suppose that is only fair, yes. But I can't say I'm interested in listening to any more of Shady's lousy excuses, so I'm heading out for now. See you later, Madame Gloomy. <laughs> <sighs> I can't believe that actually worked. Oh, thank you so, so, so much, dear. You've saved the Demiurge and I alike. Your valor truly is magnificent. Indeed, we are indebted to you. You have my gratitude, Kimberly. It's nothing, really. Though I don't know if I'd say I have valor. If anything, I was petrified. I thought for sure Ashley was going to jump over and gut me for interrupting her like that. But I also felt like if I didn't do something, she might have killed you. That scared me anyway, way more than the thought of her killing me did. Er, yeah. I knew I couldn't overpower her, so I just threw out the first excuse I could think of to try and stall her. Not exactly what I call a valor. Ah, uh, but it's precisely because you took decisive action in spite of your fear that your actions were valorous. Rather than letting your fear control you, you knowingly endangered yourself purely to save the Demiurge and I. That is true bravery, Kim. Well, I'm glad you think so, at least, and I'm really glad none of us ended up getting hurt. <laughs> Agreed. Incidentally, my excuse wasn't a lie. I do still have some questions. Please feel free to ask me anything. Or, well, I guess I really only have one question left. <laughs> Why was I the chosen one? The procedure for candidate selection, as enumerated by the specification of the Chosen One protocol that I drafted as an appendix to the main directive, was engineered to have something of an arbitrary nature in the interests of both fairness and pragmatism, as the circumstances under which the protocol would be triggered would be dire to such an extent as not to permit any extensive deliberation over the pool of potential candidates. To be more precise, once the protocol's been triggered, the next human to die with a sufficiently large burden of lingering trauma in addition to, be, to being redirected here in the same way as other traumatized spirits, rather than traveling directly into the afterlife, becomes the chosen one. Wait, so the only reason why I got picked to deal with this is because I'd been traumatized all my life and then died horribly at just the wrong time. Yes, although that's a blunt phrasing. Are you fucking kidding me? 
How is that even remotely close to being fair? It is fair in so far that no spirit was any more likely or unlikely than any other to be selected for the role. It was folly of me, however, to fail to activate the protocol in a timely manner as the decision I made to halt the admittance of traumatized spirits in the hopes that they would starve the enemies of hope by depriving them of their their, their to for uh, un uninterrupted supply of negative energy was an error. It was not until the enemies of hope achieved such great strength in numbers that they were able to snuff out the last of the hope lamps that I invoked the protocol in your death by sheer coincidence, followed almost immediately after the invocation thus resulting in your arrival here. It's arguable that my concept of what makes the protocol fair or unfair is contingent on its proper enforcement, and that the delay in its enactment is necessarily unfair, as it resulted in your selection when someone else should have taken your place. For that, I sincerely apologize. <sighs> it's okay, I forgive you. For better or worse, I've come to something of a realization about this. For my entire life and after it as well, I suppose I've been dropped into situations after situation where I felt like I had no control at all. And to a certain extent, that was true. I mean, I didn't exactly have a choice in what schools I went to as a kid or in coming here after dying, etc., etc. For the next time, I, rep I resented everyone who put me through that misery, and I resented myself for having those feelings of resentment. Since I thought it was my fault that everyone was harassing, abusing, or neglecting me, I couldn't justify in my mind why I felt so resentful. Aren't I supposed to love my family and friends? Aren't I supposed to be able to stand up to bullies? I'm pathetic. What's wrong with me? To be completely honest, I still feel that way a little bit even now. Hell, I've been trying to put my best foot forward, but I'm still feeling lousy, just from remembering how I was assaulted, let alone the other trauma. But things are different now, or I guess I'm different now. I realize now that the terrible things I had to endure weren't all my fault, and that there isn't anything wrong with me for feeling the way I do. I mean, there, there will always be countless things I can neither understand nor control, and awful things are going to happen to me from time to time. There's no helping or avoiding that. There is, however, something that I'll always be able to control. Me. Even if I can't magically make myself feel better and be happy or make my bad memories and trauma disappear, I can control what I do and how I react. It's still stressful and frightening, but I know now that I could survive things like yours of bullying and neglect or breaking up with an abusive partner. And while it's sobering to know what my trauma will never truly go away, there's still a certain comfort in knowing I made it out alive, you know? I guess that what I'm trying to say is that I feel a little more confident in my ability to confront and navigate these sorts of awful traumatic things. Moreover, despite knowing I'll never be in complete control, I feel more at ease now that I'm aware of the extent of my agency, if that makes sense. In other words, no matter what happens to me or how insignificant I might be, I'll always be me and nothing and no one can ever take that away from me. And I wouldn't want you any other way. Thank you, Jesse. It genuinely is heartening to hear or to bear witness to in incontrovertible proof that the underlying premise of my proposal was not entirely unsound. Nevertheless, allow me to change the subject, if you would, to the final remaining outstanding matter that I need to discuss with you, Kimberly. That's fine. What's on your mind? As I'm sure Jesse informed you now that you've successfully completed the mission, I am both willing and able to resurrect you if that's what you wish. Alternatively, I can send you to the afterlife where you'll be eternally free from all danger, stress, and human limitation. If neither of those options appeals to you, you're also welcome to accompany Jesse and I to Melancholia Palace to make some other petition heard. Melancholia Palace. Yes. I'm certain that the Ashen Force will return before long to wreak yet more havoc, so I feel it prudent to consult with Melancholia, the extirpator, or, or extirpator, sorry, as to what countermeasures we have at our disposal to repair, to repel it, although I fear that we may have no choice but to abandon this directive prematurely. Regardless, whenever Melancholia and I work in concert, our power is greatly magnified, and as such, we should be able to grant any desire you may have. Melancholia Palace, however, has been heavily shielded and armored in order to deter the monumental swarms of the enemies of hope that have surrounded it, and consequently, 
I would be unable to teleport you directly to the main chamber at the center of the palace with us, therefore requiring you to navigate the palace's defenses and repel any attacks by the enemies of hope on your own. What is your decision, Kimberly? I definitely need to save, that's for sure. Why is Ashley still there in my party from my last save? Oh, whatever. Well... I'm admittedly not too keen on the idea of coming back to life. You aren't? Maybe I'm overthinking it, but I feel like it's not really my place just to decide arbitrarily to come back to life after I've died. You know? I mean, there's a countless number of people far, far more important than me who's lived and died throughout human history without being resurrected. Meanwhile, I'm pretty much a nobody. What makes me somehow more deserving of a second chance at life than any of those other people? Plus, now that I remember how I died, I'm not exactly eager to reunite with the few friends I had back on Earth. Oh, my arm's falling asleep. <laughs> how did you die? I drowned. I was with my friend Robert and his girlfriend Morgan. The three of us were out on the lake next to his house that night taking a ride on his boat. The two of them had started flirting in the boat's cabin, so I'd stepped out to the rear of the boat and was looking out over the water. All of a sudden, the boat veered sharply to the side, and I lost my balance and fell down into the water. I'd been wearing a life jacket, but the one Robert had given me was kind of tight, so I had unbuckled it. it must have gotten caught on something as it was missing when I surfaced. I shouted and screamed at the top of my voice, but they must have not heard me. They didn't even try to turn the boat back around to come get me. It was very late by then, so there were no other boats out on the lake. The water was so, so cold. Before I knew it, I didn't have the strength to keep my head above the water surface anymore. I started to sink, and then... Kim. Admittedly, I know why the boat veered to the side like that, but I really don't want to accept it. Because accepting that would mean accepting that I died for an unbelievably stupid reason. I just... Just before the boat swerved, I looked back at the cabin to see if Robert and Morgan had stopped getting frisky with each other, but instead, Morgan was going down on Robert. Going down on? Come over her for a moment and I'll explain it to you, Jesse. It's an expression referring to... What? That's what they were doing? What an astonishingly poor choice of time and location for such an act. <laughs> You're not wrong. But yeah, Robert was essentially the last close friend I had back on Earth. Emphasis on was. Between remembering how I died and reflecting on the anemic relationships I had with everyone else, I can't say I'm interested in going back home. To be completely honest, I'd rather be forced to wander through bizarre, dangerous places like this surface forever than go back to Earth. There's nothing left for me there. On a somewhat related note, I'd like your input on something, Umbra. What might that be? I've been getting these increasingly strong impressions of familiarity and nostalgia from things I've seen here. However, I've never been here before. What's more, none of my memories come from my life on Earth are... Or, none of my memories from my life on Earth are remotely close enough to the things and places here to explain why they feel so familiar. Can you tell me anything about them? I cannot, but I believe I know where you can find the information you seek. The location is in a remote sphere on the outer fringes of existence, far removed from both this one and the one containing your Earth. Although we cannot bring you there, Melancholy and I can, can grant you the power to move between spheres, thereby enabling you to travel there yourself. Does that sound acceptable to you? Yeah, that works for me. I guess I'll go along with you and Jesse to Melancholia Palace then. So be it. Of course, that's easy for me to say, but I'm not too confident about my odds of surviving being attacked by monumental swarms of crawlers. I assure you that navigating the palace defenses will not be quite as treacherous as you've imagined it. Even when dormant, melancholy exudes an energy field that strongly repels any enemies of hope that draw near to it, though it has the inverse effect of attracting their attention at a distance, hence why such great numbers of them have conjugated near the exterior of the palace. Due to Melancholia's current dormancy, it's entirely possible that a few enemies of hope will be present within the palace, but most will be repelled. Oh, so Melancholia is like the lamps. 
Rather, the hope lamps have those same properties because they are composed of the same material as melancholia. The hope lamps are made from the same material as melancholia. So then, are you the same way, Jesse? Yes, I too am made from a material derived from the extirpator's body. What better to serve as a guardian against the enemies of hope than an animate hope lamp? Heh, <laughs> makes sense. Though, if Jesse's a walking, talking hope lamp, then how have the crawlers been able to get anywhere near us? Shouldn't they have been repelled? I significantly underestimated the density of the hope lamp's crystalline structure, as that information was not relevant either for the creation of or calculating the energy output of the stationary lamps. And as a result, the form I gave to Jesse is massive to such an extent that most of the energy she generates is utilized merely to move her body around, with most of the leftover energy dedicated to powering her healing and combat abilities. Consequently, her repulsion field output is very weak, which is likely why even the lesser crawlers could still approach you undeterred. I'm too heavy to keep you safe, Kim. I don't think you're too heavy at all. If anything, I'd say you have a very nice figure. Uh, wait, no. What I meant to say is that it's not a big deal if you can't perfectly repel crawlers. You've still protected me from them anyway, right? Yes, I suppose that's true. That's very kind of you to say, dear. D don't mention it, really. Master, are you certain there's no way for us to bring Kim directly to the center of the palace with us? I don't want her to be alone. Regrettably, that is beyond my power. While I'm... Boo. Rook hasn't even spoken. <laughs> what the fuck, Ashley? Don't scare me like that. <laughs> I got you good. The look on your face was priceless. <laughs> You're just always so jumpy, Kim. It makes me want to spook you. <laughs> Wait, where are we? Where's Jesse, Umbra, and Rook? Oh, they're probably still standing around on top of that tower. I bet you they're still in shock over me popping back in like that. <laughs> this is Melancholia Palace, I think. I'm not sure what else this could be, at least, and I didn't see any other places that could have been it. You mean you don't know where we are? I'm guessing based on my intuition. It's my first time here, too, you know. I... Why did you bring me here? Hmm? Didn't you say you wanted to come here to have Mel grant your wish? I could have swore you mentioned wanting the power to jump between spheres. Besides, I wasn't about to let Shady drop you out here all by yourself. Okay, let me rephrase the question. Why are you helping me, Ashley? Because you're my buddy, Kimbo. Why wouldn't I want to help you? I distinctly remember you saying that you were looking forward to destroying this place and everything in it. So, that's been my plan from the moment I got here, Kim. That's why I'm here. Just because you know about it now doesn't mean we're not a team anymore. You earned your wish fair and square. I'm not going to take that away from you. I want to help you get your reward. And I also want to make sure you leave before I get down to business here. I couldn't want you getting caught in the crossfire. I'm here to excise the necrosis, not necrosis, not hurt poor little Kimberly. <laughs> what exactly is this necrosis you keep mentioning anyway? Take a wild guess. Here's a hint. It's a pitch black. It's pitch black and smells rotten. Oh the crawlers. Bingo. The kinds of rod I've been having to track down lately can vary a lot in how they look and act, but these crawlers definitely fit the bill. This place is a breeding ground for them. Even if I eradicated every last crawler here, more would appear once Umbra tried to resume their project. And if a single one of them escapes, we run the very real risk of it hiding somewhere, multiplying, then invading and overrunning all of existence. I can't and won't allow that, so I will be destroying this place. Well, perhaps that's for the best. I mean, what's even left here at this point other than the lamps and some abandoned buildings? Is a wasteland like this really worth keeping around, especially at the risk of letting the crawlers escape? Oh, what happened to me being a menace for wanting to get rid of this place? <laughs> I guess I just misunderstood you. Say, how did you know about me wanting to see Melancholia or about Umbra was going to send me here alone? I thought you wore warp I thought you warped away before that. I might have lied about leaving and I might have instead just turned myself invisible and eavesdropped. Wait, so then 
You know that when I stopped you under the preten pretense of asking Umber more questions, that you were completely full of shit? Come on, Kim, that was super obvious. Give me a little more credit than that. Then why did you go along with it? I needed to calm myself down. You gave me a good opening, so I took advantage of it. I nearly lost my temper and attacked Umber and Jesse at full strength, which would have incinerated them, you, you Rook, and probably most of the tower. Neither you nor Rook would have deserved that, so I stopped myself. I see. Thanks for not doing that. Any time, Madame Gloomy. Also, since you're sweet on Jess, I figured I'd help you score some points by letting you be the brave hero who ran off Big Bad Ashley. <laughs> I don't know that I'd characterize my feelings as me being sweet on her. She just means a lot to me, you know? I'm very grateful for what she's done. Oh, come off it. I heard that Freudian slip of yours about Jess's figure. You're an ass and... Th yeah, you're an ass and thighs woman, eh? <laughs> Will you please cut that out? Anyway, this has gone on long enough. Fighting the Crawlers lost what little novelty it had after that scrap in the last tower. I want to end this already, so I'll do what I can to take these fights more seriously without endangering you. I have returned. <laughs> Hi, Rook. Ah, hello again, Rook. I wasn't sure if you were going to join us. I mean, this isn't really a part of the mission that I was on when you decided to join, so... My concern is with neither the exact nature nor the implied continuation of your original mission. My concern is with providing my full assistance to you, Kimberly Warren, as a means of expressing my gratitude to you for your prior service to me. Wait, how do you know my full name? There are many things that I know, and there are many things that I do not. You mentioned your name to Rook when you were on top of the tower. He remembers. <laughs> Your name lies in the former category. I can hope to explain no further. That doesn't matter. Well, whatever. I'm happy to have you with us, Rook. Let's go. Jess is no longer in your party. Ashley is now at max level. Ashley can now use the special skill Share Energy. Ashley can now use the special skill Attack Mode. Ashley can now use the special skill Defense Mode. Ashley can now use the special skill speed mode. Kim can no longer use the special skill request information. Kim can no longer use the special skill reanimate Jesse. Okay, I'm going to end it here because I've been recording for about 32 minutes. Yeah, that is a lot of talking and it looks like we got a maze going on. Alright, yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.